After the disastrous Battle of Rusan, the Sith Order was completely wiped out with the Jedi claiming what they believed to be the final blow against the Sith. But they were wrong. One man known as Darth Bane was the sole survivor of the Battle of Rusan and devised a new plan to return the Sith to dominance, the rule of two. He knew that the infighting of the Sith was their downfall and from now onwards there should only ever be two. One master to hold the power and one apprentice to crave it. So let's break down the entire family tree of the Darth Bane line of Sith Lords. Hit that subscribe button and let's get into it. And before the first Sith, I just have to mention this is only canon information so there are huge gaps in the timeline and very light detail around the early years of the Sith. So just be aware and let's get to number one. And also if you want the full HD version of the Sith family tree, all you have to do is become a member which you can do by clicking the button just below the video. And if you are a member, you can get it in full A3 poster form. With that said, let's get into the video. Number one, Darth Bane. Coming from the Outer Rim world of Moriband, which was the ancient homeworld of the Sith, Darth Bane was born around a thousand years before the Clone Wars. At the time he was born, the Sith Order was almost as numerous as the Jedi Order and sprawled across the galaxy. Unfortunately for them though, the Sith were often driven by their individual lust for power and almost always turned against each other. During his rise to the top of the Sith, Bane realized this reality and believed that it only made them weaker. This belief was confirmed to Bane at the Battle of Rusan in 1032 BBY when this infighting led to the entire destruction of the Sith, leaving him as the sole survivor. Although it was later discovered that Bane himself had a large hand in organizing the destruction of his own men. But in canon, we don't yet know how exactly this happened. Realizing that the old Sith ways were now dead, Darth Bane created a new philosophy based on the ancient Sith belief in the Dyad of the Force. Ancient Dark Side users believed that the Dyad in the Force was a nearly unbreakable bond between two Force users, which allowed them to share their life essence and become stronger as a single unit. Regardless, Bane formed this rule of two based on this ancient belief, and proclaimed that from now on there shall only be a Sith Master and a Sith Apprentice who could only ascend by slaying their master. If they died in the attempt to take the title from their master, then they simply proved that they were not worthy to hold it. He also believed that every time a Sith apprentice killed their master, the essence of the previous Sith would transfer on, strengthening the killer. This philosophy also stated that the two Sith should remain in the shadows until their power had grown enough to reconquer the galaxy, and they should train their apprentices through harsh torture in secret. Eventually, Bane fulfilled his own philosophy when he was slain by his own apprentice, Darth Zana, on the midrim world of Ambria. Number 2, Darth Zana. Darth Zana was the first Sith Apprentice in the New Rule of Two Doctrine. Not much is actually known about her in canon, apart from the fact that she was never detected as a Force-sensitive child by the Jedi Order, allowing her to be recruited by Darth Bane. After she killed her master in the duel on Ambria, she continued on his teachings faithfully and took on her own apprentice. This apprentice is still unknown in canon. Number 3, Darth Sanguis. Now, Darth Sanguis isn't the direct apprentice of Darth Zana, but his position in the timeline is currently unknown, so there's a dotted line between these two. During his time as a Sith Lord, he became obsessed with the hunt for eternal life, specifically with the focus on blood magics and dark sciences. Because of this, he abandoned his apprentice named Darth Noctis and rushed to the planet of Exegol seeking the key to immortality. There, he discovered the dark science of blood alchemy and established a laboratory on Exegol. Eventually, his search came to an end and he discovered a ritual which finally made him immortal. Unfortunately though, once completed, he was made immortal, but he was also turned into a disfigured and wretched crawling creature. He would be stuck like this forever, forced to roam the surface of Exegol. This ties into the next Sith Lord, number 4, Darth Noctis. After being abandoned by her master, Darth Noctis was furious and she ravaged hundreds of planets in the Outer Rim in hopes of finding Exegol without a Wayfinder. Noctis knew that Sanguis had gone to Exegol based on some notes found in his laboratory back home. She eventually managed to find the ancient Sith world and once she got there she came across a horrid creature which she didn't know was actually her long lost master. Eventually, she realized that this creature was actually her master who had successfully cracked the key to living forever, but with some horrible side effects. Soon after, she enslaved her former master, torturing him until he gave up his secrets, which eventually he did. Sanguis showed Noctis how to perform the same ritual that he did, and in the final part of it, he forced Noctis to kill him. This did actually grant her the immortality that she so badly wanted, but it also condemned her to the same fate as him, to live forever as a horrible creature on the surface of Exegol. The only reason he gave her the ritual was so that he could be freed, and killing him was not even part of it. He just did that so he could be freed from his life of eternal suffering. And now he had just subject her to the same thing. Number 5, Darth Kaldoth. At this point, there's another huge gap in the timeline. We don't exactly know what period Darth Kaldoth lived in, so he is placed here in the family tree until we know more. Darth Kaldoth was a Sith Lord from the Duras species who traveled the galaxy in search of the more obscure side of the Force, and how different cultures used it differently. 
In this search, he was led to the Night Sister Witches of Dathomir, where he eventually stole a burial pod from their homeworld. After the Coven of Night Sisters realized that their sacred burial pod was stolen from them, they sent one of their members named Zeldin to seek revenge on the man who stole it. In order to do this, Zeldin utilized Dark Magics, which was the Night Sister interpretation of the Force to stalk Darth Kaldoth and invade his mind, following his every thought. What she didn't know, however, was that Kaldoth was fully aware of what she was doing, leading him to tear her consciousness from her own body and trap her in his own mind forever. This meant that Darth Kaldoth had all of the power of a Sith, with the knowledge and tradition of a Night Sister inside of him. Sometime after this, Kaldoth lured out an unsuspecting Jedi Battlemaster named Bran Athmarath onto the planet Kizan by destroying its largest city. This led the two into a duel, and out of nowhere, Kaldoth allowed the Jedi Battlemaster to pierce himself through the shoulder. This stunned Bran in shock, freezing him, which sadly allowed Kaldoth to take his head off. Number 6, Rai Nimbus. So we don't know the Sith name of Rai Nimbus in canon, but we do know that he served as the apprentice to Darth Kaldoth. From the moment of his birth, Nimbus always had a dark presence surrounding him in the Force. This completely shattered his childhood, as most people related to him, and even those in his town, kept their distance. They were scared of the young boy and the darkness that was residing within him. His mother, however, still loved the young Rai and wanted him to have a good childhood, but eventually even she grew shameful of what the boy had become. As he grew into a young boy, Nimbus understood the effect that his darkness was having on those around him, so he became quiet and distant from society, living far away from everyone else with his mother and never interacting with anyone. It was at this moment that a dark hooded figure swooped in and visited the two at their home, telling the mother that Nimbus had the potential for great power. With the knowledge that her boy would never be accepted by those around him, she reluctantly accepted the offer of this dark hooded figure and allowed him to be taken away. This dark hooded figure ended up being Darth Kaldoth, who wanted to train him in the ways of the Sith. Now what happened next was even worse. The first action that Darth Kaldoth took to train his new apprentice was to drop him off on the planet Simoth and force him to become a slave there and fight in the gladiator pits. After being left alone there for some years, Nimbus became a champion of the fight pits, feared among the others. Some years later, Kaldoth returned to the pits and slaughtered all of the other gladiators before lowering his hood and revealing his red eyes to his apprentice. This unleashed a torrent of rage inside of Rai Nimbus, leading him to charge at his master hoping to strike him down. Kaldoth though easily dodged this and hurled Nimbus into the ground, cutting off one of his leku. At this point, Kaldoth knew Nimbus was ready to become a true Sith apprentice, for he had faced the pain and suffering necessary. In the following months, Kaldoth took Nimbus to various ancient Sith temples and even virgences in the Force, before coming together to study mystical Force powers which hadn't been used in thousands of years. The two soon got into a fierce rivalry though, each trying to out-discover each other with the goal of becoming the most powerful. This culminated when Nimbus stole an ancient ritual parchment, which when used would turn the person he was looking at into stone for eternity. Darth Kaldoth found out about this though, and changed the words of the ritual so that it would apply to the person reading it, not the person he was looking at. So when Nimbus went to recite the words to kill his master, he forever encased himself in stone. Some explorer may one day find his body made of stone somewhere out there in the galaxy. Number 7, Darth Sakia. Darth Sakia likely doesn't exist in history, but she was mentioned by a Jedi Master when she was telling a story to Count Dooku. Master Yoda denies that this Sith ever existed, but it wouldn't be the first time that he was wrong about something like this. Number 8, Darth Kristoff. This is another Sith that likely didn't exist in history, but he was featured in a tragic play that was performed in front of Republic Senators during the Clone Wars. In the play, he began as a Jedi, but soon had his heart broken by another Jedi girl, and because of this, he fell to the dark side. Realizing that he had fallen, Kristoff's lover aimed to make him face his destiny, and the two lovers dueled with Kristoff eventually defeating her, and being moments away from killing her. Unfortunately for him though, he stopped for one final moment to profess his love to her, and she used this hesitation to stab him through the heart. His lover then lay down on the ground with her hand holding his, begging the Force to know why Kristoff made her kill him. That's a very sad story, so if this did exist in history, I feel bad for the guy. Number 9, Darth Tenebris. In Legends, Tenebris has a pretty rich and interesting history, but in canon, not much is known about him just yet. We do know that he was the master of Darth Plagueis, and because he was from the Bith species, he was incredibly intelligent. He actually even designed Maul's personal starship, the Scimitar, before his death. He also had a Sith Trooper Legion named after him in The Rise of Skywalker. Number 10, Darth Plagueis. Darth Plagueis was the master of Darth Sidious, and again, he has a very rich story in Legends, and a very light one so far in canon. We know that he was a member of the Moon species, and was deeply interested in biological sciences and the midichlorians. He also discovered how to do essence transfer without killing the person, which is what the Rule of Two was, and he found the key to immortality, but could not use it for himself. After passing on his teachings to Palpatine, he was killed by him, before getting the chance to use his own teachings. 
He was also alive during The Phantom Menace, but died shortly before Palpatine ascended to the position of Chancellor. Number 11, Darth Sidious. Now, this is where the family tree gets absolutely crazy. We all know the broad story of Darth Sidious from the movies, but over his reign he orchestrated the Clone Wars, reigned as Emperor of the Galaxy, and oversaw extensive cloning and dark sciences programs, eventually leading him to transferring his essence into a clone body. Palpatine actually started four new Sith lines, with one of them being very weird. The first is the Darth Maul line. Number 12, Darth Maul. Darth Maul was found as a young boy by Palpatine, and he was eventually taken on as an apprentice. During his early days, Maul was taken to Malachor to view the desecrated battlefield, and he was sent around the galaxy as the Fist of Palpatine. Eventually, he was defeated by Obi-Wan Kenobi on Naboo, but that wasn't the end of him. He survived this, and returned with the help of his brother Savage Opress. With his survival, he travelled to Mandalore and built up a criminal alliance known as the Shadow Collective, who helped him to overthrow Duchess Satine, giving him control of Mandalore. He then defeated Pre Vizsla to become the first Sith Lord to claim the rulership of Mandalore and the Darksaber. Sometime after the Siege of Mandalore, he was then marooned on the planet of Malachor, stuck there without a ship, possibly forever. Luckily for him, that didn't happen, and he was soon found by Ezra Bridger, Ahsoka Tano, and Kanan Jarrus. And that leads us on to the next in the Darth Maul line. Number 13, Ezra Bridger. After their arrival on Malachor, Maul recruited Ezra Bridger to become his Sith apprentice, and they together opened the Grey Holocron which gave them the location of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, Kanan Jarrus definitely did not approve of this, but Ezra did kind of follow Darth Maul in the Sith path, at least for a short amount of time. Despite this short stint, Maul ultimately failed to keep him as his apprentice, and Ezra rejoined Kanan and the others. Now, we do have to go back up the tree for the next Sith. Number 14, Darth Tyrannus. Dooku was one of the most respected masters in the Jedi Order, but he saw how the Jedi was faltering and how they were becoming disconnected from the regular citizens of the galaxy. Because of this, he chose to leave the Order and was then recruited by Darth Sidious to lead the other side of the war for him as a Separatist. The difference with Dooku though is that he actually believed in the Separatist cause and that people on Separatist planets deserve to be treated better. Unfortunately, he was just a placeholder for the man who Sidious truly wanted as his apprentice, Anakin Skywalker. But before we get to the Darth Vader line, we have to go down Tyrannus' line further. Which leads us to number 15, Asajj Ventress. Now, Ventress wasn't a true Sith apprentice, but she did serve as an acolyte of the Sith because Sidious and Dooku were the master and the apprentice. And this really shows you how the Rule of Two badly started to degrade by this point in time. The disregard for the Rule of Two started with Darth Plagueis, but by this time, it was pretty badly disrespected. Eventually, Sidious grew worried about Ventress and ordered Dooku to kill her, but he failed at this job, leaving her betrayed and bitter. This then leads us to the plot to kill Darth Tyrannus, and puts us onto a side branch of the tree. Number 16, Savage Opress. On the whim of Mother Towson, the leader of the Night Sisters at the time, Savage Opress was enhanced with Night Sister magics, making him a tremendous force of nature. He was soon sent to serve as a dark acolyte of Count Dooku by Towson and Ventress, but didn't realise that he was just being used in her plan for revenge. When Savage discovers this, he turns on both Dooku and Ventress, and rushes off to find his brother Maul. At this point, he becomes the apprentice to Maul and served only him. He was then killed by Palpatine after his brother got too powerful and became too much of a threat to Sidious' rule. And that brings us back to the Ventress branch of the tree, and her apprentice, number 17, Quinlan Boss. Near the end of the Clone Wars, the Jedi Council were becoming increasingly worried that they may lose the war. Because of this, they jointly decided that cutting off the head of the snake or assassinating Count Dooku was the only path forward, despite being against everything they stand for. For this mission, they chose Quinlan Voss, who was considered to be one of the best spies and secret agents in the Order. During his mission to carry out this assassination, he used Ventress to get closer to Dooku, but he fell in love with her along the way. At this point, Ventress taught her both how to utilize the dark side of the Force and some basic Night Sister magics. Eventually, Dooku turned Quinlan against Ventress and became the apprentice of Tyrannus himself. His love for Ventress brought him back to the light side, and Ventress jumped in front of Count Dooku's lightning to save his life. He then buried her on Dathomir along with her lightsabers. So, with the death of Ventress and the return of Quinlan Voss to the light side, the line of both Darth Tyrannus and Darth Maul comes to an end. Number 18, Darth Vader. This one needs no explanation, but Darth Vader was the chosen one, and he was chosen by Palpatine from a very young age to become his final apprentice. After promising that he could save Padme, Palpatine convinced Vader to join the dark side, and also to help wipe out any Jedi who survived Order 66. It was this very difficult task in wiping out the Jedi survivors of Order 66 that led to Vader being appointed the Order of the Inquisitorius. They were originally headquartered on Coruscant, but after causing too much commotion there and accidentally killing a senator, they soon moved to the Mustafarian moon of Nur, where they projected their fear across the galaxy. From there, the Inquisitors hunted down all remaining Jedi in the galaxy until the disaster on Malachor, where they got bodied by Kanan, Ezra, and Ahsoka. 
They were then dissolved very shortly after. Now we get to the final Sith on the list who isn't really a Sith but now kind of is, number 19, Snoke Snokington. And I'm just kidding, Snokington isn't his real name, but his story is very much still a mystery, but we know that he saw both the rise and fall of the Galactic Empire and that he is a strand cast created by Palpatine and was controlled by him for a very large chunk of his life. Either he was created from birth on Exegol, or his DNA was captured after his birth and used to create the clones in yellow on Exegol. We know from The Force Awakens that he had one apprentice before Kylo Ren who was more powerful, but nothing else about him, and then he had Kylo Ren. Because Palpatine was controlling Snoke, but he did also have free will, you can technically now call Kylo Ren a Sith, but we still need more information and I wouldn't call him a Sith just yet. That will likely come from The Mandalorian Season 3, The Bad Batch Season 2, and Andor. So that is the full family tree of the Sith Lords so far. Thanks so much for watching guys, really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and I will see you in the next one.